Welcome to Ultimate Marriage. Today we're going to be talking about how we fight, forgive, and forget. So, uh, fun conversation today, and I am excited to talk about it. I think it's a common need in the church today. Um, some expectations before we get started. One is I'm not feeling super great. And uh, why you need to know that, I don't know. But um, if you're watching us, I guess that makes more sense because we have this on a YouTube channel. You can watch these on YouTube or you can also listen to them as a podcast. Um, but yeah, uh, we've been walking through trials as you guys have all uh, seen and heard on social media. And last week we had a issue, I had a kidney stone. And this week my stomach's hurting and uh, we're trying to make progress through this. Veronica's feeling better. Um, mm-hmm. from her ailments and things. Mostly, yeah. Mostly, yeah. So um, so that's good. But um, a couple things before we get jumping in. Um, if you guys are a regular listener to the show, or even if it's your first time, uh, would you be willing to leave a review uh, on iTunes? All you have to do is just in your app, literally just click the stars. You don't even need to leave an actual review. You can, I mean, if you can, or if you do, that's awesome because we'd love to read them. Um, We read every single one of them. But if you just tap the stars on how much you rate the show, that'd be great. Um, And uh, what else? Oh, and a couple things. My book, Safe from Success, if you are watching on video, you'll see it right here. I have a copy in my hand. Um, It is on sale last week on Amazon. And uh, it's only $8 for the hardcover copy, which is a big deal because it's regularly 16 bucks, and it's actually supposed to be nineteen ninety nine. So um, if you get a chance to pick it up, I talk about a lot of the things. We talk about marriage. We talk about children. We talk about family. We talk about freedom, all from a biblical perspective. And it's a short book. It'll only take you an hour to two hours to read. It's very short. And so uh, just wanted to share that with you guys. Um, Veronica's listened to it. Yes, I listened to it on audio. Yeah. Made me cry. Oh, <laughs> I don't know if I knew that. Um, the other thing is uh, a lot of you guys are asking how you can support our ministry um, in terms of donation. And we actually had uh, one couple emails this morning asking how we could, how they could um, give uh, to support other people's marriage coaching sessions with us. We, For our Ultimate Marriage Program, we do some kind of emergency coaching for some of those folks um, who are in dire straits. And we uh, we charge for that. And this couple wanted to offer uh, money or a kind of a, um, what's it called when you get a, a scholarship? Uh, oh, okay. Yeah, a scholarship for that. So if you guys are interested in supporting our ministry, Ultimate Marriage right now is currently not a nonprofit, but our other ministry, Relearn Church, is relearnchurch.org. If you want to support our ministry, and it does help because we are in the thick of ministry, um, and we would use that money towards ministry efforts, um, you can go to relearnchurch.org forward slash donate. And that's a spot for those of you that have been asking for us. And again, we're just super blessed by by that. And uh, we would we would have usage for that on making sure that we get the word of God out, making sure that we're helping couples and other marriages um, save them from divorce. That's mm-hmm. kind of the big thing that we're trying to help with. Um what are we talking about today? How we fight, forgive, <laughs> and forget. <laughs> so just give us your, you know, Veronica, just give us your experience of, of, you know, the fight life. Oh, man, where do I begin? I'm just kidding. We know nothing about this. Um, all right. On a serious note, um, the first two and a half to three years of our marriage, especially the first two, were just a nightmare. Mm-hmm. <laughs> we fought tooth and nail Mm -hmm. like crazy yell at the top of our lungs whoever can get the loudest (laughs) won I guess and uh, we would threaten divorce we would leave the house I would I would leave get in the car and take off for a couple of hours not tell you where I was and oh man it was it was was a nightmare and I and I was really bad at holding grudges too like not just like for the rest of the night like for days yeah Mm -hmm. yeah and um you know, so a couple of things, guys, you know, we have a four step process that we follow now that is a, I think, a biblical process. We'll talk about that here in a little bit. Um, we want to share that with you on how we fight right, I guess, mm-hmm. would be able to say that. Um, so a couple of things, disagreements and discussions are very normal in a marriage. Fighting is sinful. So if you guys fight a lot, you're sinning a lot. Okay, that's just, just a real reality is that a fight is sinful. And uh, we want to, st- a Christian marriage should not be having uh, a fighting marriage. And fighting really occurs when there's at least one, but generally two, prideful people in the room. 
Um, and I'm going to actually say two because you can't argue with a humble person. Um, and a lot of people think that fear is the enemy of love. I believe that pride is the enemy of love, um, or at least one of the enemies of love. And pride is the core heart of, of a marital fight. And um, so, yeah, we're going to talk about the, uh, the way that we fight and the way that we actually we don't even fight the way that we have a disagreement disagreement yeah that's and, and come to a conclusion yeah mm-hmm. so yeah today we rarely fight we don't fight pretty much at all i mean it very rarely does something mm-hmm. like that come up um but it's literally like nothing compared to how it used to be when we yeah. first got married um and so what dale and i do is we try and follow this four-step process um that is rooted in scripture to get to a conclusion Mm -hmm. to become unified again Mm -hmm. um, and to have peace in our marriage again. Yeah. And and people, this is a thing that I think that a lot of the people in the church need. I mean, I think Christian couples are really good in the publicity department, meaning that they can actually put on kind of like an Academy Award winning level, you know, performance that everything's good over here Mm -hmm. and we're okay. Uh, When we get home, we fight like cats and dogs, but Hey, you know, on the internet and at church, we're good. But the reality is, is that uh, God... Your marriage is in turmoil. Your, your marriage is in turmoil. And and just because people don't see it, God does see it. And so uh, let's talk about a few scriptures that are important for the conversation uh, about fighting. Uh, just, these are just precursor scriptures that we're going to mention that I think set the foundation for a proper discussion, debate, argument in a marriage. Yeah, they're good scriptures to know when you're, like you said, about to enter into this type of... Yes. Yeah. So um, 1 Corinthians 13, 4 through 7, um, it says, love suffers long and is kind. Love does not envy. Love does not parade itself, does not puffed up, does not behave rudely, does not seek its own, is not provoked. That word provoked or there means is not easily offended. Thinks no evil, uh, doesn't believe the worst in a person is what that's saying. Does not rejoice in iniquity, but rejoices in the truth. It bears all things and believes all things. So we don't think that someone's lying to us when they say they're not. Hopes all things and endures all things. Um, it endures all things. That is the biblical definition of love. And um, I want you guys to just have that in consideration as we talk today. Uh, Philippians 2, 3 through 4. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others could be your spouse, more significant than yourself. Let each one of you look not only to his own interests, but also the interests of others. So when you have a discussion, you need to be looking to the interest of your spouse. Um, In reality, God expects us to value the outcome of the argument for our spouse more than the one, than the outcome for ourselves. Meaning that we should be looking at growth. We should be hoping for unity, for their emotions, their heart. Um, and, you know, we, we have to realize that we're not having a conversation with a problem. We're having a conversation with a person. And and we can't fight. If we fight just against the problem, we could just wound that person really badly. Mm-hmm. And if you just realize that you're talking to a person, you need to treat them as Christ would treat them. It's just a really important process that, that has helped us find restoration. Um, it's just having a biblical mindset on fighting. And so we're going to talk about our, our four-point process of how we fight, which means for us is... Have not, a discussion. Have a discussion. <laughs> yeah, because we don't really fight anymore. But th- you can apply this on top of... If you guys get into fight mode, like it's fight I was night. I say, yeah, there, but there was a transition. We didn't just like go from fighting like cats and dogs to not fighting at all. It was totally. learning this process and like getting mad and angry and wanting to fight and then con- just having self-control and controlling ourselves and you know, just carrying out the conversation, um, in a much more healthy manner. Yeah, totally. So, um, our first step that Dale and I usually, well, always, um, start with is the offended spouse gets to speak first. Mm -hmm. So that's, you know, tally point number one. Um, and in Matthew 18, 15, it says, if your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. If he listens to you, you have gained your brother. So first what I will do is I'll go up to Dale and instead of just spewing out my offense, I'll let him know that, hey, there's something that I would like to discuss with you. And typically he knows what that means. Like it's it's not usually like 
unicorns and dandy dandelions it's yeah. okay we need a, a discussion needs to be had yes and um and so we'll set up a time to get together to have that discussion we're not going to have it right then and there especially if it, there's going to be tension or frustration um right about to go to dinner or we have friends or, coming over or our kids are in the room yeah um not that we haven't had these discussions in front of our kids because we have in a healthy manner we're not yelling at each other yeah. um but we'll set up a time typically in the evening after our kids go to bed um and so what like going back to that scripture i'm gonna go straight to dale once we are at that time yeah, she's not going to go tell her friends. I'm not going to go to my friends. I'm not going to go to my mentor. I'm not going to go to his mentor to have his mentor call him and correct his behavior. But she's done before in the early years. I've done that before, yes, but that was a long time ago, and <laughs> I don't do that anymore. It was bad, and and um, but that was, again, like in the first couple years of marriage. Yeah, and so, yeah, don't go to anybody else. Go to the person who has offended the offended you first. Yeah. And so once we're at that scheduled time, I'll go ahead and do that. Um and a rule that we stick to, which is, I think, a, where a lot of couples can really struggle. I know we used to really struggle with this. It kind of just snowballs is people start to bring in other offenses and other things. Well, you always do this and you always do this. And um, so our rule is to stick to the issue. Yep. Don't bring in past offenses. Don't bring up um, other people's flaws. It's stick to the issue. Um, and yeah, that's been stay that's focused been, on that. point. Yeah. It, it really is, if you're bringing up past offenses, it, you know, it says in First Corinthians 13 that love keeps no record. Mm -hmm. um, are you keeping a record of offenses? If well, you are, that's sinful. Well, and if you're keeping a record of offenses, then you never really forgave them in the first place. Exactly. It's resentment and bitterness, which we'll talk about in a little bit. And so we don't do that. Um, mature Christian couples, biblical couples do not do that. And again, we used to be this way. So yeah. just know we are speaking from walking outside of these boundaries yeah. outside of these uh, and we still fail rules. when we do this here not that often mm -hmm. I, I i do believe that we could look you in the eye and say follow our example um so we're not hypocrites in saying this but but it is hard and so mm -hmm. we're empathetic to that process of how hard it is it takes a lot of self-control yeah so step one is to uh the offended spouse gets to speak first step two is the offended the offending spouse gets to humbly respond or repent. Those are your options, okay? You get to respond if it's a if it's a um illegitimate accusation, you get to respond um with, you know, some sort of well, let me explain actually. Let me bring some some clarity to your curiosity or to your criticism that you brought here. Uh if it's if it's legit, then um it's time for for repentance and we'll talk about that. Um the word humble is really important in this. I've eaten so much humble pie, guys. My stomach hurts because I've eaten so much humble pie. That's what's going on. I think we both have. Yeah, I, I've <laughs> I've had to literally, in our house church, stand up and repent to the entire church because of my behavior before. I've had to re apologize and repent to Veronica. Like, I know what it means to be humble. Not that I'm a professionally humble man, but the reality is, is I, I understand how painful that is to our flesh to walk in the spirit and do something humble. And that quote that we say on the show a lot, it's from the guy that disciples me, uh, Matt Jacobson, is uh, you can't argue with a humble person. Just mm -hmm. remember that. Um, so uh, Proverbs 9, I'm going to read this real quick. It says, rebuke a wise man and he will love you for it, but a fool despises correction. A godly wise man or woman appreciates being corrected it's the fastest way to a healthy marriage. If there's something wrong, if your spouse, if you're one and unified with your spouse and there's something hurting them, you should be ready and excited to correct that so that you can be one again. You shouldn't want to be divided. And that's, that's so just again, remember that rebuke a wise man and he's going to love you for it. That's wisdom right there. Proverbs 15.1. I'm going to give you another proverb here. It says, a soft answer turns, turns away, away wrath. wrath. But a harsh word stirs up anger. Um, what do you got to say on that? I'm just, I've had this one memorized okay. <laughs> before. I mean, it's, I'm a little rusty, but yeah, yeah, I'm in our personality traits. I'm definitely more likely to get angry easier than you do. I get flustered easier than you. So I've had that, had to have that scripture memorized, not only just for our marriage, but even in parenting. 
yeah a harsh it's, answer turns away wrath yeah, or a soft answer, a soft answer yeah so yeah just being very <laughs> just tone of your voice control yourself um you know I'm, I'm looking at my notes here there's a massive difference also i want to say between being apologetic and being repentant an apology means i'm sorry being repentant means that i'm changing my behavior there's that quote that says the best apology is change behavior um re- that's repentance okay repentance means the word literally means to turn from or to turn away from it means that you're no longer going to behave that way yeah i think it's actually both because i can tend to um, if I've offended you or I've done something wrong, even if I know I, did, I like spoke to the kids too harshly, I'm bet I'm pretty good at being like, okay, well, just don't do that again, and just try and make it better from there. Where I actually haven't repented yet. Sure, like to them. Yes. Yeah. And so when I humble myself and apologize for my actions to your face or to the kids, which I did that earlier today, I got on Ari's case about doing s- or about yelling, and. Uh, she was like, oh, no, that wasn't me. It was Honor. And their voices sound so much alike. And I turned the corner and it was Honor. Um, and so I had to apologize to her. I'm like, I'm so sorry. I, I thought that was you. Anyway, um, so acknowledging mm-hmm. it and repenting for it, they both need to happen. Yeah, yeah. And we got to f- remember that Christianity is about dying. It's a, it's a faith of self-denial. Jesus says to pick up your cross monthly. No, he says to pick up your cross <laughs> daily. Uh, and, you know, we have to, you know, the cross is the instrument that destroys your flesh. It literally kills your flesh. Uh, A.W. Tozer says, allow the cross to do its deadly work in your life. Um, that's important. Allow it. Allow it to, do, to kill off your flesh. Paul says uh, in 1 Corinthians, I think it's 9, he says, I discipline my body, uh, my flesh is what he's saying, and make it my slave. He puts mm-hmm. his his flesh into subjection of his spirit, and it requires that in a fight. It requires that in an argument, in a discussion. Is I'm going to walk in the spirit, and I will not fulfill the desires of the flesh. That's what it says in James. Um, and so th- that's a part of it. And Veronica's going to talk about the defensiveness part of it, um, because that's that's another thing I've struggled with defensiveness. It's yeah, hard. like if I if I if there's an issue that I want to approach deal with. And you're instantly defensive every time. Um, It makes me afraid to bring up any type of correction or offense to you. Yeah. Um, Because I'm because you're constantly defensive. I can't even get a word out. I've trained her to. I've trained her to believe that that when you bring something, I'm going to fight back. Yes. Instead of just at least hearing me out, you're not that way anymore. And but we've like you know we've grown through that. Yeah. Um. And every now and then we can struggle with it. But for the most part, you're definitely ready to listen now. Yeah, defensiveness mm-hmm. is a declaration that you're not wanting to grow or not willing to grow. That's just how I've always defined it. And um, so be careful with that. It's also a sign of pridefulness. It is. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. So point number three. Point number three, the offended spouse gets to forgive. Veronica is going to take this. No, I'm kidding. Um, we, we, Veronica and I have struggled with this conversation about forgiveness for a long time. It's just, it's hard to do. Uh, Veronica can speak to her own experience with this. She was in a home where she um, didn't see forgiveness modeled a lot. Um, Very rarely, if ever. Yeah. I think, you know, I can probably count <laughs> on one hand the amount of times um, I would see someone asking for forgiveness in my house yeah. as a child. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So it's, it's something that we've been trained by our experience. And um, just because that happened to us doesn't mean that we get to behave like that. Mm-hmm. We get to be sanctified in the word of truth, just like everybody else. Um, so Matthew six fifteen says, uh, but if you do not forgive men, their trespasses, neither will your father uh, forgive your trespasses. These are the words of Jesus. Um, that scripture should scare you. Um, how many unforgiven people are in heaven zero none none and so um don't mess around with that scripture uh you can have theological gymnastics around that but c.s lewis and myself would come to the same conclusion i've studied what he said about this specific scripture Um, but if you don't forgive men their trespasses neither will your father forgive you and so um, if you want to not forgive your spouse you're dancing in the danger zone at the very least of your eternal security Um, it's a scary thing and sure there's a fantastic 
argument, I'm sure, against what I'm saying, but the reality is there are two pretty def- uh, prominent camps in theology on this, and one of them is filled with great theologians and makes the same case as I do. So be very, very careful with that scripture, to say the least. Um, Ephesians 4.32, Paul says, he also says this in Colossians, uh, and be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God and Christ forgave you. We forgive our spouse because we've been forgiven. Mm-hmm. You know, um, withholding forgiveness is denying your own need to be forgiven. We forget how much we've been forgiven when we when we refuse to forgive our spouse. Um, and it's it's be sober about this. You're gross. You're vile. You're wicked. You were forgiven. You were a sinner. Now you're a saint. You now have access to heaven. You know how ha- you are reconciled with God the Father through Jesus Christ. Jesus died for you for that. You've been forgiven and given so much grace, you, like you can't even comprehend it. Mm-hmm. And then you're going to not forgive this one small trespass. There is a parable about this mm-hmm. that you can read about Jesus talking about the parable of the debtor and the king forgiving his debt. And then he goes and asks the people that owe him a little bit of money and puts him in jail. And you need to read that that he, or that uh, parable if you're struggling with that. Hebrews 12, 15 tells us to not let a root of bitterness rise up in us. That root will bear fruit. What kind of fruit? <laughs> Bad fruit. Bad fruit. Bad fruit, not good fruit. Um, and then also... How much does God think about your sin after you've been forgiven? Yeah. Or after you've repented? Yeah. Uh, he doesn't think about it at all. Yeah. It's as if it never happened. Yeah. Our, our he wipes the slate clean. Yeah. We're white as snow. Um, as far as the east is from the west, uh, bottom of the ocean floor. These are the, the scriptures that talk about that. When someone repents, that's where the sin and the memory of it goes. Yeah. So if you want to be like Christ, then to forgive means to forget. It really does. Which is why I brought up earlier, in the middle of an argument, you do not bring up past offenses. Yeah, it's, it's, Because it's, if they were worked through, and they were repented of, and asked for forgiveness, and they, the words, I forgive you, have been spoken, then they have now been forgotten. Yeah, and it's, it's advertising your own unwillingness to forgive, is what, what the, that, that record keeping is. Yeah. Um, yeah, and this doesn't mean that life stays the same. Um, there might be new boundaries because of sin. If there, you know, if there was infidelity or something, yeah. something like that. Um, this is for the benefit of building back trust and not for the resentment of sin. Yeah. So w- you can just because you've forgiven, you forgot about it. It's gone. It doesn't mean it doesn't change the life or the relationship going forward. But you're not putting up changes that are for resentment and for protection. You're putting at them for the benefit of building trust back because there was something lost and it needs to be brought back. Um, you are not having a divine relationship with your spouse, but you are to model that divine relationship. So I think that that does give some um, some clear boundaries for you there. Um, so, so our last step, step, last step number, number, four. number four. Both of you get to pray with each other. It's the hardest part. So a fight is not over until both of you pray with one another. Yeah. And mm-hmm. um, we did this a few days ago, like last <laughs> week. And we had a conversation and yeah, about, yeah, we got to, we got to pray with one another. And um, are you willing to, so when this, if there's, if you've been forgiven and a lot of people are really good at verbalizing, oh yeah, you're, I can't forgive you. But deep down it's like hurting still. Um, the praying together is the authentication of that forgiveness. Because it, it really authenticates, like, was this real? Are you actually forgiven? And so, um, and we both pray. Mm-hmm. I'll start. I'll initiate the praying. I believe this is the husband's job. And, um, you know, outside of sex, I think that praying together is probably one of the most intimate things you can do with, with your spouse. Um, and so, uh, caring for one another. So, yeah, and then Veronica will pray with us. And, I mean, how does that feel as a wife, you know, when that's... On that journey? I think it shows me um, that, yeah, you care about restoration and unity in our marriage. Um, it's also hard for me um, just because I am naturally more of like 
I need the, more time. The heated one. I need more time to get over it. But but it forces me also to humble myself and to look at the grace that has been extended to me, mm-hmm. that Christ has extended to me, um, like you mentioned earlier. And yeah, so. remembering how much you've been forgiven. Mm-hmm. It is. It's one of those moments because you have an encounter with God when you do that. Um, so a few additional rules that we're going to just kind of throw on top of this right now um, is I'm going to start with this one because it goes best with point number four. If you can um, and you're married, have sex. (laughs) And the reason is because that's the truest, I think, sign of restoration, even more than prayer. I mean, I think you should pray for sure. But if you can have sex, it, it is actually a, a surefire sign that you have been, Unified. Physical representation of restoring unity. Yeah. And um, and so that that is another way that, you know, you can be fully back into a unified relationship with one another. Um, a, a note I wrote down here is that if you can't walk in the spirit, then ask to walk away. So if you guys get into your anger mode and it's fight night at nine o'clock at your house, um, if you can't walk in the spirit, then ask to walk away. And we've done this before. Yeah. And I would actually say, um, if you are going to take that step to ask to walk away, give yourself a time frame, 20 minutes, 15 minutes, don't walk away and not return. Or without a time. Yeah. Giving like, yeah. yeah, Don't let the sun go down on your anger. Like you need to come together and still have that conversation. Give yourself 10, 15 minutes to cool off. Um, but make sure you come back after that. Yeah. And that's what I tell people who call me if they're, they're having a fight in their marriage, because, you know, we're, I'm a pastor at a, at our house church. And, um, yeah, if we get a call about that kind of stuff, we go, we'll just take 15, 20 minutes and walk away and then come back and try again and remember these things. Um, and so th- the other thing that we never fight in front of your children, you can discuss in front of your children. You can argue even gently in front of your children, but so that you can show what, biblical restoration and reconciliation looks like but don't fight in front of your kids yeah no Um, yelling no you want to just throwing a tantrum yeah you want to destroy your child's heart do that you know um one of the quotes that i love is uh is you know your your relationship with your spouse might be the only marriage book that your children ever read Mm -hmm. and don't make them hate god's design for marriage because you walked in an immature manner um and um the last thing I'm going to say is if there's conflict currently in your marriage, like right now, if you guys aren't like totally unified, I'm going to put the responsibility on the husbands to go and seek out. It wasn't the church that sought out Christ. It was Christ that sought out the church. And we are to be modeling that, that relationship. So I, I, I'm encouraging you men who are listening. If you're not totally good with your wife right now, it's your job tonight to go and start the reconciliation process. And uh, try this, try our four steps out. It works for us. Um, I believe it's biblically backed and hopefully that'll help. Um, so that's, that's our teaching time for today. Um, we're going to talk about some questions. We have two, I think, really good questions that we're going to answer. We answer two questions at the end of the show. And uh, hopefully that'll kind of help you guys uh, on your journey walking out biblical Christianity. All righty. Question number one, how important is it really to have a marriage mentor? I'm letting you take it. Oh, great. Um, I don't think it's like absolutely necessary. There are people out there that have healthy marriages and never had a marriage mentor. But I will tell you that the day Dylan and I got a marriage mentor, our marriage turned around. Yeah. In a huge way. Huge way. way. Yeah. It was. So, yeah, we had those two and a half to three really rough years. Two years were the worst. That last third year was kind of getting better. And then year four was no yeah you're four you're four to like yes, yes, eight sorry yes year four was when we met our marriage mentors yep and completely turned around yeah it's changed mm-hmm. our life in terms of just having a biblical perspective uh a a disinterested third party um mm-hmm. now meaning that they're not like vying for one side of right the, of the they're marriage. for our unity yes mm-hmm. they're for both of us yeah not for just me or just you um, but, and so, yeah, I would just highly recommend it. If you can find a biblical married couple, um, to mentor you do it. I it, mean, what's, what's the harm in it? 
Yeah, and and you know, there's a difference I think between I'm um, just to do a vocabulary thing here is that the difference between mentor and discipler. Um, I think that these people are our mentors or our they discipled us. Mm-hmm. They really did. There's a difference. I think mentoring is is kind of got a business sense to it, where discipling is like they're fathering us and mothering us, the way that a biblical father and a biblical mother is to do that. And we have kind of, I guess, um, eradicated this way of walking out of the church in a big way. There's, we're not pairing up older couples with younger couples or older believers with younger believers. This was very commonplace in the early church. There was discipleship happening. It is part of the Great Commission. Um, go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptize in the name of the Father, the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey, teaching them to obey all that I have taught you or that I've commanded to you. So it's, that's the process of the Great Commission in Matthew 28 to do that. And so um, we, we, we really do I, seek it out. It's hard to find, sadly. Um, if you could find it, it is a game changer, in my opinion, to have someone discipling you towards Christ, towards the Word of God, and who is more mature than you and can walk you, walk you through those things. So, Great. Question number two. Is it a husband's job to teach his wife scripture or should she be zealous in her own walk and seek clarification and expounding from him? Yeah, both. So, yeah, Veronica seeks out scripture on her own, Mm -hmm. um, but I am also her lead pastor. And if I have a question, I ask you. I don't go to Google. I don't go ask our mentors. I don't ask um, a pastoral figure, I, I'll ask you. Yeah, and it's not that it's sinful that she, if she went to Google, the reality is that she wants to to follow what the scriptures say, is that if you have a question about the scriptures in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, go ask your husband. Mm-hmm. And that's talking about the church context. Um, but the idea is that the church is to turn to the, to, to the Savior, to Christ, and that we are to model that relationship again. Um, so she seeks those things out. Now, I have a thing to say to the men, again, to the husbands, is that if there's any other man in your life who is pouring into your wife spiritually more than you are, you got a problem. If there's any man pouring into your children's life spiritually more than you are, you got a problem. So the average church sermon is, say, 45 minutes, 60 minutes. That means that if your pastor is pouring more into your wife than you are, that <laughs> means that you're not even doing an hour of investment per week into your wife. You mm-hmm. should be investing, it, you know, at least 20 minutes a day, you know, just a conversation. Um, Veronica and I, the way we look at it is I talk to Veronica about the Bible kind of all day. Um, or whenever I get a chance, or what this teaching, or I'm, you know, this podcast. Well, yeah, we're in full time ministry, so your job is preparing messages for podcasts, or mar- preparing messages for the Ultimate Marriage Group, or messages for Sunday, and so um, you're a verbal processor as well. And so I'm, I tend to be a sounding board for you. And so, um, yeah, it's just kind of all day. Um, but even outside of preparing, like. We still have conversations. It's just our way of life. We just talk about it all the time. We will, The kids will do something, and it sparks a thought uh, on a scripture, and we'll start talking about that. We also, you know, I read to the kids in the morning. Mm-hmm. Every morning. I haven't been doing the last week because we were on vacation. Um, but generally, most of the year, I'm reading every morning for 10, 15 minutes in the morning. And we're talking about a lesson. We're praying together. Um, and I try to do just some sort of lesson with Veronica as well. I just talking to her about certain concepts or certain stories or what's in the news or whatever it is, just pouring into her spiritually. So it is the man's responsibility, the husband's, I should say, responsibility to pour into his wife spiritually um, about the word of God. Wash her mind with the water by the word is what it says in Ephesians 5. Um, and uh, yeah, and that's that's really the, the core issue of it all. So um, we got a memory verse for you guys this week, yes. and and uh, this is a you guys should have this one memorized. This yeah. was a really good one. Um, we've I've I feel leaned like on this really a lot. Practical books of the Bible. Just read Philippians. I love Philippians. It's, um, it's one of my favorite books of the Bible. Um, just, it's such an easy read, very practical, very applicable. Um, all right, Philippians two, three, and four. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interest of others. 
Awesome. Memorize that, guys. Uh, mm. we, we need to know the Word of God in order to live out the Word of God. Mm -hmm. um, so again, if you guys would be willing to leave a review, they really do help the exposure of the show. They really do help them get on the charts. Other believers can hear and find our podcast because of those reviews. Um, and again, you guys can get uh, watch the podcast, uh, the video podcast, and look at all the notes we have at ultimatemarriage.com. Just click on the podcast page in the navigation. Uh, on that note, we'll see you guys next week. See you next time. Thank you for joining us on this episode of Ultimate Marriage. If you're homesick for a stronger marriage, visit our website at ultimatemarriage.com and consider enrolling in our one-year online marriage mentor program. Also, if you're interested in learning more about building a better marriage, follow Veronica and I on social media, where each week we share tips, tricks, and lessons on building a biblical marriage. 